Hey guys, my roommate gave me a button. You want to hear it? Sorry. Hey, my bad. Sorry. I'd like to take a brief moment to offer my apologies. <laughs> Warning, this podcast contains violence, sexuality, gore, and other horrible and disturbing things. Listener discretion is advised. Also, the hosts of this venture are ignorant dipshits, so please do not take anything they say as fact. And enjoy the show. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then we'll begin. Today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. It is our basic human right to be fucked up! A second plane now has crashed into the other tower of the World Trade Center. Put chemicals in the water that turned the friggin' frogs gay! The defendant shall be incarcerated for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. You are not machines! You are not cattle! You are men! We were somewhere around Barso, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. 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 Hello, and welcome to Occulte Veritatis Podcast. I'm Oud Gallifrey. And me! And I am Richard Bigley. And presenting the topic this episode, special guest... Arthur Tallis. And I'm going to talk about Thomas Midgley Jr. Thomas Midgley Jr. was born in May of 1889 in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. He's the winner of five medals for his works in chemistry and engineering, and is said to be had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single organism on Earth's history. But before we talk what? about his poisons, we should have our own. So, what's your poison? So, anybody following me on Twitter and the Discord is probably familiar with the often uh, spoken about um, Bigly Kush. Oh, yes. We, we've all gotten glamour yeah. shots beside oh, it, yeah. if you're paying attention to our social medias. Yes, yeah, so uh, Bigly Kush uh, had eventually succumbed, I believe, to old age, and it became time, in my mind, for harvest. Now, I have never grown marijuana before. I have never smoked marijuana that I have grown. I have, this is all new to me. I've never had to harvest. I've never done any of this. So I don't know. I could maybe grow some pretty shitty bunk weed or maybe it's pretty awesome. But um, I am going to show you on the webcam um, my harvest. Oh, Ooh. Ooh, it's a pretty fun. healthy bowl of weed. Like that's, that's like a, that's like a salad that'll feed a family of three, you know? And the, the uh, you know, apple of my eye is this little guy right oh, here. Shit. Oh, good lord. Yes, it, so it's, it's hairy. It's a little twiggy, about, you know, kind of hefty. About three and a quarter inches, yep. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's about and, the size of an obese hamster. Right. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That's a, that's a perfect size. Yeah, three and a half inch long obese yeah. hamster made yes. of wheat. Cool, yeah. I'm going to have nightmares And that's all one tonight, giant yeah. nug. Kush. I'm going to put it in my grinder right now. We should open this segment with like the, the intro from like 2001 Space Odyssey or something, you know? You know, the funny <laughs> part is whenever you guys tell me like on like in the recording to put it in, the music cues in at the exact moment you suggest it. It, it, it works like magic. All right. So I am going to be consuming the Bigly Kush. Out of a fresh virgin glass pipe that I purchased today on my way past a marijuana store called Living Skies. Mm -hmm. And uh, this little pipe here, it's a little guy, and uh, it uh, cost me $4.20. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Always of course. Coincidence. And so here we go. He's taking a sip. He's doing a breath. He's yeah, looking handsome as ever. Oh, it's nice. Smoked very smoothly. Uh, the the pre-smoking smell is a little bit on the fruity side of things. Like it's got a little bit of skunk, a little bit of fruit. I, I kind of like how it smells. 
Um, and the, the smoke is, is very smooth, given that it's, like, not filtered and just, like, stuffed in a, a glass pipe I bought today. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I'm, I don't know, I, I look forward to sharing it en masse once the quarantine is over, and I put this all into a big fucking Ziploc bag. For those patrons wondering when we're going to go back to live recordings, it's going to be when, like, scientists and researchers say it's safe to do so in groups as large as our recording group. And probably, like, six weeks after that, because it takes, like, six weeks for an episode to get out. But, like, if the politicians and businessmen say it's safe, why do we have to listen to the scientists, Ood? That's a good point. You know what? <laughs> Fuck my body. I want that economy Ood. to keep on growing. You gotta, you gotta sacrifice yourself for that big red line they show on the, the stock market day after day on the yeah, news. I bleed, there, but know. line go up. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, red number scary, therefore make yeah. less red number. Hey, it's it's just common now. Right. <laughs> like, like, non, like, untrollingly, like, the, the whole concept of, like, people seeing ancient cultures as barbaric because they're, like, portrayed as throwing people into a volcano to appease some god in the sky. Like, look what we're doing with capitalism. We're throwing people to the machine every damn day. Yes, get sick, but, you know, you you made your boss some money so you can die happy. You know, even though you didn't pay your rent that month and now you're dead, but, uh, you know, you can die happy because, you know, you made your boss some money like you were supposed to, so And good job. Jeff Bezos is due to hit a trillion dollars uh, fairly soon, so he's going to be the world's first trillionaire. And, uh, and today he announced pay cuts to his Amazon <laughs> staff. And like, what? have you guys, have you guys ever just thought that maybe he works a trillion times harder than you do? Yeah. Like, come on. You know, I pick up one box and he delivers like the rest of the boxes, you know, all over the Amazon warehouses around the world. Yeah. There you go. Sounds He's like reasonable. Sandow, but, richer and more but he gets up at 5 a.m. and has a massage and like meditates and stuff and like... That's the other thing. I hate when I hate when CEOs CEOs say say CEOs say they have like a an eighteen hour day when like they count like eating with their family as part of their work day and shit. Yeah, well, I was thinking about my email, so it must be work yeah. time. Fuck off. Well, I think about my email too off of work time. When where's <gasps> my my overtime pay? Or... <laughs> no kid. <laughs> I I mean I could certainly use the hundred and something dollars a minute that they're getting, but <laughs> no kid. Good evening. If you own or drive a car, and that's most everybody, major changes are coming your way. After years of evidence that lead emissions into the air are a major health hazard, the federal bureaucracy has finally acted, and it is going to mean big changes at the gas pump. Joyce Schenck has been looking into the impact of an EPA decision to drastically reduce lead in gasoline. Joyce, when we say drastic, it, it virtually takes lead out. It, yeah, 91%, it, right. yeah, it virtually does. If you've got one of those classic 1969 Impala convertibles or a Ferrari or a Ford Torino, you may have less than two years to consult with your mechanic to figure out what fuel to put in your tank. The Environmental Protection Agency moved to eliminate 91% of the lead in gasoline by 1986. On a typical day last month, U.S. motorists used 122 million gallons of leaded gasoline. What comes from leaded exhaust is a polluted atmosphere and damage to children, like brain damage, learning disabilities. Estimates? 300,000 children have levels of lead in their systems that are considered dangerous. Time-lapse satellite pictures have confirmed the annual appearance of the massive hole, shown in red and purple at the center. One theory for the appearance of the hole in the ozone layer is that it's a natural phenomenon caused by the Antarctic's climate and the solar cycle. Wing pods carried by the research aircraft were pre-programmed to collect meteorological data to test this idea. But the most popular theory is that man-made chemicals, chlorofluorocarbons, known as CFCs, are causing the problem. CFCs are widely used in aerosol packs and to expand foam plastics used in packaging. But when released, they float up into the atmosphere where, under the action of sunlight, they release chlorine. One part of raw chlorine can destroy 100,000 parts of ozone, O3 as it's known to scientists, a form of oxygen which filters ultraviolet rays from the sun. 
And speaking of the ultra-rich and people who get rich off of uh, the sacrifices and deaths of others, Thomas Midgley Jr. was born in May of 1889, and he graduated from Cornell University with a degree in mechanical engineering in 1911. 1916, he found himself working for General Motors, and he was working on a very specific problem. Now, old shitty gasoline would do this thing called knocking, because old shitty gasoline would burn at the wrong time sometimes and cause a ping or a, uh, a, a spike of noise. A car is made up of wheels, seats, fuzzy dice, a body, and an engine. The internal combustion engine. The engine works in four stages. First, a valve opens and the piston lowers, letting a mixture of fuel and air into the combustion chamber. Second, as it comes up, the piston compresses the fuel-air mixture. Third, a spark from the spark plug ignites the mixture, which pushes the piston down again. Fourth, the exhaust valve opens and as it comes up, the piston pushes the spent gases out. And the cycle starts over again. Intake, compression, combustion, exhaust. Intake, compression, combustion, exhaust. Intake, compression, combustion. They're trying to figure out how to stop knocking in engines. And Thomas Midgley Jr. found out that if you add a compound called tetraethyl lead, it reduces knocking. But of course, lead's bad. And they knew at the time that lead was bad for you, so they didn't call it tetraethyl lead because you don't want lead spewing out of your, your tailpipe. They called it ethyl, like your grandma. Uh, they even found that <laughs> if they put it in the wrong way, it would foul up your engine. So they made it a super special, different way, and now it comes all out the tailpipe. Oh, goody. One convenient place. Yeah, one convenient place where all the lead escapes into the atmosphere. Yeah. Now, 1923 rolls around, and for this discovery, the tetraethyl lead cause, or ends knocking, uh, he was awarded the Nichols Medal for use of anti-knock compounds in motor fuel. You know, good, good on you, Thomas. Is that like a is that like a science and technology award or something? Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was an award for chemical engineering or, or chemistry in general. Okay. Sweet, sweet. Hmm. Uh, so, so some years after 1923, he actually um, got lead poisoning. Uh, shockingly enough, and had to go off to Florida to recuperate for a bit. Um, oh, and while he was in Florida. Oh, of course, Florida will remove lead from you. What, like, oh, is it like the hospitals and recovery centers there, or, or was? Oh, oh no, it was the good ocean air. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, we're we're talking early. Don't 1900s. forget, this is nineteen eleven. Oh, gee, uh, twenty sophisticated <laughs> medicine, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, when you're feeling bad, you just go breathe some nice ocean air, and the lead goes away. Apparently, yeah, I mean, better than a hole in the head, right? Yeah, so while this is happening, there were two deaths and several cases of lead poisoning in the factory. Um, and after these two deaths, they were so depressed, they almost gave up on tetraethyl lead entirely. Like, like the industry was almost ready to give up on, like, this compound. Yeah, because people were dying producing it. Yeah, and it's got, got some bad raps. So it was hard to market, hard to sell. Yeah, except, you know, they kept going and there were eight more deaths that year anyway. Um and in fact, General Motors came down and said, you know what? This isn't working out. This process you have to make it is too slow, and we need to make more and faster. So 1924 rolls around, and General Motors and the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, now called ExxonMobil, uh, founded the DuPont, or found that this was too slow and created the Ethyl Gasoline Company with Midgley as its vice president. Yeah, and just to be reminded, this is happening right after World War I, and fuck did World War I ramp up like gasoline and fuel production, because the war front needed it. Yeah, and, and like, this was in the time where people were still, you know, pre-dirty 30s, people still wanted to buy cars and, and have that American dream sort of thing, but they don't want this knocking, so you gotta get as much lead in there as possible. Yeah, can't have knocking, that's not classy. Yeah, so within two months of using this new process, uh, the plant had a bunch of cases of lead poisoning, hallucinations, insanity, and five deaths. Yeah, w wonder. It's almost like lead eats holes in the brain. Yeah, Sounds yeah. like a podcast episode. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> In 2015, Flint, Michigan reminded us that lead exposure is still a very real problem. 
But some gaps remain in the research on childhood lead exposure. One of these is long-term associations with mental health and personality. So to fill this gap, researchers tracked almost 600 children born in the 70s in Dunedin, New Zealand. And first, a little backstory. During that time in history and in that geographic location, levels of lead in gas for cars was extremely high. It was some of the highest in the world at the time. Basically, you know, any child that's, I suppose, playing in a park or breathing the air around automobile access areas, like they're going to be exposed to the exhaust and therefore the lead. So the exposure was broadly distributed. It's often difficult to disentangle the effects of lead from the effects of socioeconomic status. But in this case, lead exposure was not related to socioeconomic status. Another unique aspect of this study was the length of follow-up. They followed these children for over 30 years. So that's giving them a lot of data and a lot of time points. 94% of the children had blood lead levels that were above uh, the level that were, would require clinical attention. Um, so that's, you know, quite extraordinary, I think. But what about outcomes in adulthood? In terms of personality, the researchers observed lower conscientiousness and agreeableness and higher neuroticism. And for mental health, they observed internalizing and thought disorder symptoms and higher general psychopathology. The associations were modest, but they suggest long-lasting consequences for mental health and personality. This is an external environmental factor that presumably is modifiable. It's worth sort of approaching the findings or the results from that perspective, which is to say there is something that can be done about this ultimately. So in October of that year, Midgley had a press conference to show everyone just how safe tetraethyl lead was. And to show how safe it was, he dumped a whole bunch on, on his hands and then huffed it for a full minute, like stood in front of a crowd with a bottle of tetraethyl lead and went. Shit. Oh, my God. I mean, I, you, you got to give it to him for having balls. I mean, th th those those fucks who won't drink like fracking fluid when it's presented to them after they said they would drink it like they didn't go through with it. But apparently this guy believed in his product enough. Yeah, and, you know, he thought that the, the small amount of lead he was going to get wouldn't hurt him at all, even though he'd already been lead poisoned once in the line of work. But whatever. It's like when politicians, uh, you know, drink Flint, Michigan water that one time when they're in Flint to show that it is safe to consume that one time. Yeah, but also that that was probably a bottle of water. But as far as we know, Midgley actually huffed lead in front of people because, you Ooh. know. Good time. As you do. Yeah. Um, so the state of New Jersey shut down the plant uh, because it's not safe. Obviously, people are dying. People are having hallucinations. Um, and Midgley had to take another vacation to Florida because he had lead poisoning again. Yep. Need another, uh, you know, 100 cc's of fresh air. Yeah. So, so because of all of this, he was actually fired as the vice president. Uh, due to a lack of experience in organizational matters. You, you know, up until now, I just had a thought. Up until now, I've been saying fresh air, like, derisively, like it's a bad thing. But I'm forgetting that <laughs> this is the age of leaded gasoline. And there's literally lead in the fucking air. Like, so fresh air getting away from, like, vehicles spouting out leaded gasoline actually probably might have helped them. Yeah. Yeah, just not being, you know, in a place where you have to huff lead in front of a press conference for a minute like, yeah probably better for you than not yeah sorry i'm high took me a while to get it <laughs> <laughs> so so what is a man that is good with chemistry to do when he's no longer working on this leaded gasoline thing well a frigidaire who was owned by general motors had a different problem you see they worked on refrigeration units like uh, freezers and refrigerators and air conditioners and back in the 20s, they used to use ammonia and butane, sulfur dioxide, propane, and all kinds of nasty stuff as refrigerants. The problem with these being that they're either toxic or flammable or both. In fact, there was a clinic in Cleveland 
that uh, lit on fire, and a whole bunch of people died because they didn't have, you know, protocols for that kind of stuff at the time. Yeah. But, like, it's such a huge trade-off. Like, manipulating refrigerants to, like, trap heat in order to make a space cold, like, was such a huge advantage for humans. Like, you didn't have to hunt every day to get fresh meat, and you didn't have to keep livestock around to have fresh milk and fresh eggs. You could store it in this cold place, and that'll free up time for you to pursue other careers, other interests. It freed up, like, billions of human labor hours. But, of course, at the cost of the environment. Yeah, and, and again, like a refrigerator, a, ref, eh, a refrigerator works really, really well when it's not also emptying ammonia into your house. Or butane. Yep. Or, or sulfur dioxide, which is literally just poison. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want any of those in my lungs. Those don't sound ideal. Yeah, so in 1930... Uh, a team was assembled with Mr. Midgley uh, working on it to figure out a way to make a, a, a refrigerant that was no longer toxic or flammable. And they came up with the idea that they take a hydrocarbon, add some chlorine and some fluorine to it, and they created a thing called dichlorodifluoromethane, or Freon. Yeah, mm, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yes, Freon is a chlorofluorocarbon, also known as a CFC. Now, as soon as this came out, it went into refrigerators, it went into freezers, it went into inhalers, it went into hairspray. And it's like, yeah, well, these are and these are super exotic chemicals not found in nature, and they're super exotic because they boil and they vaporize at really weird temperatures, like they're very far removed from water, and because of that, that vaporization and that boiling can be manipulated to move heat around but because they're such weird exotic chemicals not found anywhere else like nobody knew how they interact with nature yeah and and that's the problem with with cfc's that we'll talk about in a bit is that they interact with nature really really badly earth's atmosphere is made up of six layers the second layer, called the stratosphere, contains the ozone layer. The ozone layer is made up of a highly reactive molecule called ozone, which contains three oxygen atoms. Ozone is a trace gas in the atmosphere. There are only about three molecules for every 10 million molecules of air. But it does a very important job. The ozone layer acts as Earth's sunscreen, absorbing about 98% of damaging ultraviolet or UV light. But the ozone layer has gotten thinner. Chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, are the primary culprits in ozone layer breakdown. A CFC is a molecule that contains the elements carbon, chlorine, and fluorine. CFCs are mostly found in refrigerants, aerosols, and plastic products. When CFCs are exposed to ultraviolet rays in the atmosphere, they break down into substances that include chlorine. The chlorine reacts with the oxygen atoms in ozone and rips apart the ozone molecule. Areas of damage in the ozone layer are often called ozone holes, but that name is misleading. Ozone layer damage is more like a thin patch with the thinnest areas near the poles. The ozone layer above the Antarctic in particular has been impacted by pollution since the mid 1980s. There, the region's low temperatures speed up the conversion of CFCs to ozone damaging chlorine. About 90% of CFCs currently in the atmosphere were emitted by industrialized countries in the Northern Hemisphere. In 1989, the Montreal Protocol banned the production of ozone-depleting substances. Since then, the amount of chlorine and other ozone-depleting elements in the atmosphere have been falling. Um, now, he did win in 1937 the Perkin Medal for uh, chemical works, which is a different metal now for a better thing. And of course, as he was wont to do, he did show people how safe it was by taking a, a dose of it, 
<laughs> inhaling a whole bunch of it and blowing out a candle to show you it was safe in his lungs and not flammable. Jeez. Yeah. And and luckily for him, he was right. It's not toxic. It's not flammable. It's actually pretty okay. All right. So, okay. So he, he at least he didn't put the health his health at risk two times. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good way to look at that. Now, we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll end his life real quick because it comes to an end pretty quickly here. Um, and then we'll talk about why he is the single most uh, influential organism on our atmosphere of all time. Uh, so in 1940, at the age of 51, he got polio, which is a thing we don't have anymore. Yeah, because of vaccination. Thank God. <laughs> I don't know. Those anti-vaxxers kind of want to bring it back, though. Yeah, polio's bad. It causes all kinds of shitty, shitty things, including making your body essentially just not work anymore. I don't know. It'll be like the Justin Timberlake song, you know, I'm bringing polio back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, don't bring polio The back. motherfuckers don't know how to act. All them, all the vaccination. I don't know. I'm trying to figure <laughs> something out on the fly, and I'm kind of high right now, so it's cool. I don't know. As, as a fan of personal space, a big metal tube to myself, I don't know. That sounds... Per yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Iron Lung, that sounds just spanky. Yeah, and that's, su that's super close to Iron Man, which is pretty metal, so yeah. Yeah, so good. So 1941, he gets yet another medal from the American Chemical Society, the highest honor, the Priestly Medal. He's also awarded the Willard Gibbs Award um, and is elected the president and chairman of the American Chemical Society in 1944. Oh, I, I bet he got to wear a big hat. Guess what else happened in 1944? He did? He died. Now, here's the fun uh... part. Guess how Thomas Midgley Jr. died? From inhaling Freon? No, it was lead poisoning. Freon. It also wasn't lead poisoning. So polio makes it really hard to get around. And he was bedridden. So he rigged up an elaborate series of pulleys and ropes so that he could lift himself out of bed to, you know, talk to people. And one night he tried to lift himself out of bed and got entangled and was strangled to death by his own traction. <laughs> Oh no, that's oh, sad. Wow. Yeah, which is really, really sad. It's a sad way to go. But also, this guy did have, again, the worst, like, he didn't mean to do any of the things he did, but they're just the worst chemicals that he could have made. I mean, I don't know. It. I don't, be, I don't really believe, like, in karma or karmic justice or stuff like that, but this is an instance where it, it like, appears to have happened, like, coincidentally. Like... A man whose inventions have led to the death and torment of so many falling death to one of his own inventions? That, that's, that's a bit poetic. And, I mean, they were burning unleaded gasoline, like, all the way up to the 70s, hey? Yeah. And, like... Yeah, they've been burning it for a long time. Uh, actually, here we go. Uh, according to the history of gasoline page that I just found on the Energy Third. Information Administration, um, it says here, leaded gasoline for use on on-road vehicles was completely phased out as of January 1st, 1996. Mm -hmm. So, like, in my lifetime, as in me as a young lad kind of lifetime, this has been phased out. Wow. I can tell you the I last was, time when it existed wait, around. I was nine in 1986. It was not that long ago. Yeah. So in the 1940s, let's talk about tetraethyl lead. In the 1940s, there was a geochemist trying to tell how old the earth was. And the way to do that is say, well, there's uranium there. I'm going to see how much of it turned into lead because that's a thing uranium does. Oh, he couldn't get any good readings because... Everything was covered in lead. Everything. Because it came out of every car. So he had to take a series of different clean rooms until he could finally get a good reading. And then finally got, you know, his reading and was pretty accurate. And then said, well, why the hell is there so much lead around? And, like, I, I, I learned about this guy through uh, a TV show called Cosmos. And I think they portrayed his story as well. And I read a bit more about him after I saw it. And uh, when I read, like, his journals about, like, th 
the way he had to go about with the final clean room, like there was four stages and each stage he had to take off the clothing from the stage before and completely scrub down and he had to remove anything from the outside and get totally new equipment and he had to open up brand new sterilized equipment for each, like it was insane the lengths he had to go to to remove lead. Yeah. And of course that's also in all of our lungs. Um, 1960s, is when the first uh, actual study came out saying that tetraethyl lead is toxic. So it's already been in the air for 40, 50 years. And we're just going to be like, well, now we'll say it's toxic. And I think it's reasonable that, like, scientists at the time, like, journalists at the time, were probably, like, contacting these companies and letting them know. I can't imagine there weren't activists back then, like, letting people know that these things are harmful and they're still selling it. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and that's one of the other problems we'll get to in just a sec, because in the 1970s, there was a study that said that children who had high exposure to lead and high lead blood content did worse in school. And that study got out and was peer-reviewed, and then a lobby group for the lead people uh, started saying that it was scientific misconduct. And for years, they, they bogged it down and bogged it down until finally a, a third party said, no, they're right. Lead causes bad things, you dipshits. Anyway. Being, mm -hmm. being a lead lobbyist has got to be right up there with being like a cigarette lobbyist. Like, mm -hmm. they, they, they're, they're obviously harmful. Like, the, the evidence is, is right there. Like, it's... It's scientifically proven, like, across the board, but yet they are, it's their paycheck to say it isn't, you know? Yeah. yeah. So in 1973, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the States, finally issues a regulation for a lead phase-out. Not stop it now, just to phase it out. Um, they are immediately sued by the ethyl gasoline company, because they still existed. Uh, and finally, after appeals... Almost 10 years later, they mandated a 91% reduction in leaded gasoline. Mm -hmm. And like Richard had said, uh, by 1995 or 96, there was only 0.6% of sales were leaded gasoline. And in 96, they did finally ban it. So did they make exceptions for like farming and industry <clears throat> and like big scale stuff like that to get rid of what's left or what? Yes. Well, so they let planes have it. Um, because those don't go over everyone. Uh, they let race cars use it. Uh, they let boats use it. And they let, like you say, farming implements use it. Because, you know, that doesn't spew lead onto crops. But uh, oh, man. I mean, people are... Oh, I, I didn't even think of that. Christ. Cr oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, oh, no! I'm thinking of, like, some conservative guy on the steps of some government or in front of some gas station screaming and ranting about how it's his right to burn leaded gasoline. And, you know, even though there's like unleaded available right there, he's screaming and insists upon this leaded gasoline. It's that, that kind of like, shit I think was happening. Like, like I'm, I'm, I, I can see it. I'm sure some conservative whack job somewhere was doing that. Like, like how they're like, oh, I'm not going to your store because I have to wash my hands before I, you know, touch the groceries. You know, like, yeah. like the, those people today. <laughs> I, I'm sure they existed back then. And some guy was like, no, you can't phase out the lead. I need it. I need it. And, and like there was no reason. And, you know. But but the, these like group of people probably just kept hanging on to the lead, screaming and crying that they absolutely needed this leaded gasoline. Well, and you know what they use now for an anti knock compound? Ethanol, ethanol. Like, alcohol. like alcohol. That oh, yeah. it's, it's just burning ethanol in certain concentration makes the. But like, I don't think you guys are seeing the full picture here. It's pretty obvious to me that the lead compounds, which were passed out through society and made into like the brains and bodies of all, were like protective compounds against the chemtrails being dropped on the population. And now that that's being removed, we're all susceptible. <laughs> yeah. Did I tell you about the alien hybrids and the man hybrids? Man, they're just making they're making babies down there with cows, and they're, oh, it's a male devil experiment. Man, I didn't know we they're had They're eating such... babies, and, yeah. and who knows what they're doing over there. We, we, we can't <laughs> trust them, and, and so there's, you, there's the aliens. 
I didn't know we the, had the budget. I'm out of gasoline was just a reptilian plot. That's all it was, was a reptilian plot from the reptile people. I know this. I know this because I, I know a guy who works at the Denver <laughs> airport. And oh. uh, he tells me all the shit that goes on there that they're hiding at the Denver yeah. airport. See when I grabbed this rent? Well, and how would we ever know? Because David E.K. was was deplatformed from from YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. How would we ever know? It's the liberal media. Oh, Fake there's news. an Alex Jones episode coming, by the way. He's just like he's a man so near and dear to my heart that it's gonna take it's it's gonna be a big episode because he has a lot of history. <laughs> Didn't he start off kind of like moderate and sort of decent, and then just eventually went down the rabbit yeah, hole? Yeah, he, he was far? even he even like had some sentiments that sounded like, like, like admittedly like anti-government, like, and he had like ideas that sounded like socialist, and some that were arguably like communist. Like yeah. he really believed like in the power of the people against the corporations, against the big man. Like, like he was kind of a man of the people back then, but now he's like a tool of Donald Trump. Well, like, I, I think Infowars, like, back, like, originally was a very kind of, like, libertarian, uh, you know, we don't need the government to tell us stuff, but, but like, not crazy, we don't need government, but, like, you know, most people can generally govern themselves, and, you know, government shouldn't be, you know, bailing out corporations and and, and that sort of thing, and then... You know, I, like, I, I swear, I, I think one of my friends had even once back in, like, the early 2000s had posted on Facebook, you know, kind of back then. And they were like, why does this site I like sound like a conspiracy site? Like, it's a terrible name for this website that has all this news and, and good information. And then it's like, you, know, you fast forward to, uh, you know, 2020, and it's the laughing stock of any reasonable well, thinking he, he's, person. He's right off the fucking deep end. Like, his justifications and, like, the story he's built, like, you have to pay attention to his work over a long period of time to get exactly what he believes, because he puts it out in bits, but he seems to believe that every ho every Hollywood liberal, every media liberal, every journalist liberal out there rapes children and babies in order to worship the devil, because that puts the right energy inside of themselves so they can worship the devil and put evil energy into society to try and defeat God. And it's up to every patriot out there to defy the government and defy, defy liberals and defy journalists in order to strengthen themselves and build up the power of God inside of themselves to defeat the child-raping um, uh, liberals. Like, that's where he's gotten to. He started out as like, I'm kind of anti-corporate and fuck the man. Now he believes every Hollywood liberal is a demon worshipping child rapist. I'm kind of I'm kind of impressed and also terrified that you just rattled that off your head. <laughs> we need to do an episode on QAnon too. That I, oh, I'm, I think I'm going to put that on my list. We need a QAnon episode, and it'll probably be oh, quite yeah. a long If you long want help one. debunking like all the bullshit claims that the QAnon crowd passes around, like sign me up. There's so many. There's so much misinterpreted statistics in that. It, it, it's it's uh, sorry. Okay. Anyways, talking about tetra ethylene. I'm drunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's get back to tetra ethylene. I'm so hard now. <laughs> so it's 2000. The U.S. has said you're not allowed to sell your product anymore because it's, you know, like hurting people and causing bad shit. So, you know, what do you as an ethical company do? That's right. You go to the third world and make their governments let you sell tetraethylene too. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. So that happened and continued to happen. And... Luckily, though, in 2011, oh. the UN announced that as far as they could tell, there was no more tetraethyl lead being as sold. As far as in they the could world. tell. What? Yeah. As far as they could tell, which is probably wrong. And I'm sure there's still lots out there, but it took almost 100 years to stop putting. Uh, there, lead there's in the some, air. there's some like sovereign citizen, like libertarian, like in the middle of Arkansas that has like. <laughs> Has like a twenty thousand gallon drum of it, and he's like, "Yeah, silos." He's just got silos of this oh, stuff, yeah. eh? and I made mean, all this gas goes super cheap. I got it really yeah. good on the discount. government says I can't put <laughs> yeah. soup, the right soup in my, I mean, gas in my car. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and like, and like they found there's been studies out too that find that like the high levels of lead in the atmosphere actually cause probably. Um, violent crime 
So like this drop in violent crime that we've seen in the States, that's sort of that uh, mid to late 90s and, and continue into the 2000s. Every president says that they did it, even Trump, even though he wasn't the president for 20 years. But it's probably mostly due to the fact that we're not yeah. pumping lead out anymore. And is there any explanation as to why the lead would cause, you know, cause crime? See, I didn't look into it, but I'm just looking now that there's uh, three studies that are linked on the Wikipedia article. Um, uh, I guess call back to the I, Flint, Michigan episode. I explained a little bit on uh, that one, but um, basically um, lead in the brain during development kind of damages the parasynthetic nervous system, which causes a uh, quicker flight or flight, uh, fight or flight responses um, when... Uh, confronted with adverse situations at least when when i watched a video of a researcher explain one of the papers in question he kind of described that um it causes people to react uh, more aggressively more quickly and it also causes them to interpret situations as more dangerous or more threatening than they are first there was flint then the reports started flying in from everywhere norwalk st louis st paul chicago pittsburgh columbus they've all found lead in their water or soil Lead is a known toxin. There is no safe level for it in the blood. It can cause neurological damage and is linked to all sorts of problems like cancer, heart disease, stroke, anemia, high blood pressure, behavioral issues. Lead can cause a wide variety of health issues. That fact has been told in almost every story of almost every new case of lead being found in our soil or water. What isn't being reported as much is that lead poisoning is actually a cause of crime, according to researchers at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. They found that the more lead kids have in their blood, the more at risk they are of being arrested for a violent crime as a young adult. In fact, lead in their blood increases their chances of turning to crime by almost 50%. That's because lead poisoning decreases a person's ability to control their impulses. A healthy individual might stop and think before committing a crime, realizing the potential consequences of their actions, and not do something stupid. When a person has a lot of lead in their blood, that kind of intervention by the brain gets blocked. So the more lead in a person's blood, the more likely they are to do something stupid, like commit a crime they could regret. Their research is backed up by numerous studies, which links the amount of lead in a city's water to its crime rates. For instance, in LA, the area with one of the highest crime rates is South Los Angeles, and it also has the highest concentration of blood lead levels in people under 21 too. Also, in areas where lead has been cleaned up, crime has gone down. And not surprisingly, the areas with the most lead in the water are also our poorest. So not only do poor people get screwed with poisoned water, they get screwed by all the crime that is caused by that poisoning. Interesting. So so sort of like a fetal alcohol syndrome, but instead of like alcohol, it's it's lead. Yeah. And it's okay. after birth, probably. And it yeah. happens after birth. Okay. Well, and there's and there's still places in the States and probably Canada and probably lots of the world where if a child plays by the side of the road they're probably getting enough lead on them and in them because they're children that like it's doing them harm. So it's, it's not a problem that's fixed yet. Like lead remediation is a huge thing and will continue to be a huge thing. Unfortunately, thanks to Thomas Mitchell Jr. Yeah. I mean, put, you know, put a giant hole in the atmosphere, you know, poison the brains of, well, I, I don't think there would be a single person on earth who wouldn't be exposed to it. Like even, even a hermit's way out in the wilderness with the amount of vehicles that were running during that time period. It, I don't think there'd be anywhere on earth that wouldn't be affected. Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, even if not the lead exposure, the fact that he also produced Freon, which the problem with CFCs is that they deplete the ozone layer. And it wasn't until the eighties or mid eighties that they actually said, let's not do CFCs anymore. And even then, that was held up because of lobbyists from DuPont saying, no, 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 we they actually said we wouldn't make something that is unsafe. Oh, yeah, I was just, I, I had a little query in my brain and I wanted to look it up. And it seems that there's there's evidence that um, people of the future will be able to track kind of like the rise of humans by like seeing kind of where the lead begins to accumulate in the soil. Yep. 
and they're actually saying that the ozone layer will actually be back to a pre-CFC state sometime around 2050 to 2080, assuming that everyone oh, continues. Oh, good. J- to just when, like, global warming should really kick into gear. Yeah. So, you know, when I when I said at the start that uh, he was had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single organism in Earth's history, it's not really that yeah. big a jump. I mean, no single tree, no mm-hmm. single fungus. Even those big, giant, fuck-off forest funguses, they didn't affect... Like, as much as he did, you know? No. And that's pretty much it for Thomas Midget Jr. Almost luckily he died at the age of 51 and didn't go on to produce more wonderful things. Someone even said he had an instinct for the regrettable that was almost uncanny. (laughs) Oh, boy. I think so. Yeah, I I see that. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, it seems he rolled all natural ones when he was choosing, like, what he would pursue in life. And the fact that he was really good at it. Like, not only did he, he's like, oh, I'll put lead in the gas. And he was okay. really effective. Yeah, he rolled a natural one for discovery, then rolled a natural 20 on implementation. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that's all I got. Uh, for a Culte Veritatis podcast, uh, I've been Ude Gallifrey. And me. And the uh, person Bigley. presenting this week's episode, thank you very much for taking the time to research. Uh, sing yourself out and sing the podcast out. I, I will not sing, okay. but I will be Arthur Tallis. Arthur Tallis have fun Closing tonight. time. I go the fuck home. I don't tonight. want you in here. I still have to clean. Arthur Tallis Make no him, Arthur. Fun tonight. Arthur Tallis. Arthur Tallis. <laughs> fuck you. Okay, goodbye. Love you. Bye-bye. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Bye. <laughs> Playing us out this week is the band Bats. From their album, The Sleep of Reason, here is the song, Thomas Midley Jr. Thank you for letting us use your song, and you won't be hearing from me in the after show. But the goddess herself has a message for us all. Hail Val, and see you next week.
Satan's Valhalla here. I know these are difficult times. Some people are being stupid, but I know none of you are. Our community is more important than ever. We must continue to be here for each other, be supportive, and do everything we can to keep this community healthy and safe. I'm so proud of all of you. You're all doing an amazing job. Let's keep this up and get rid of this fucking COVID. Love you all.